Welcome back, everyone. We're diving into a topic that's, uh, well, it's pretty mind-blowing, to be honest. Yeah. AI mega clusters, those gigantic collections of GPUs that are used to train, like, the most powerful AI models out there. We're talking Elon Musk's XAI, Meta, Google, Amazon, the big players in this race to build bigger and, I guess, better AI. Yeah, you could call it a race, that's for sure. And it's incredible how fast these clusters are growing. Like, right now, Elon Musk's XAI, they have this Memphis cluster, and it's enormous. 200,000 GPUs. Wow, 200,000. That's a... Uh... That's a lot of processing power, right? It is, yeah. But Meta is not that far behind, you know? They have their own cluster with 128,000 GPUs, and then there's OpenAI. They've got 100,000 GPUs set up. So it's like this constant one-upmanship. But, I mean, it's not just about having a ton of GPUs, right? Like, how they work together, that matters too, doesn't it? Absolutely. The way those GPUs are connected, how they communicate, that's key for making the training process efficient. So even if you had, like, a million GPUs, if they weren't talking to each other properly, it wouldn't really uh, work. You got it. You need that smooth communication for the whole thing to work. So what's next? I mean, are these clusters just going to keep getting bigger and bigger? Oh, yeah. The trend is definitely towards larger clusters. There's this new collaboration, Anthropic and Amazon. They're building a monster. 400,000 of Amazon's uh, Trinium 2 chips. Okay. Wow. That's, uh, that's getting serious. But, you know, I think a lot of people, when they hear about all this, they might think, oh, this is for, like, running chat GPT or something, right? The everyday AI stuff. Not exactly. Those consumer-facing AI applications are impressive, but uh, these mega clusters, they're mainly for something called training. Training. Yeah, it's like teaching AI models to learn from huge, massive data sets. Like, imagine feeding an AI millions of images, videos, text, everything, so it can understand the world. Okay, so like, boot camp for AI. Mm-hmm. But on a massive scale. And all this training eventually leads to what even more powerful AI. Right. And while pre-training, you know, feeding it all this data, it's a big part of it, the real explosion. It's going to come from post-training, I think. Post-training. Now, that's a term I haven't heard before. What exactly is that? Well, it's like after the initial training, you have these tasks like self-playing games, robotic simulations, stuff where the AI has to actually, like, do something, show its skills. So, like, testing it in the real world? but uh, a simulated real world. Exactly. And, you know, the interesting thing is this post-training, it's becoming so integrated with the initial training, the lines getting blurry. We're building AIs that can learn, adapt, do it all, basically. It's all starting to blend together, huh? But with these AI models getting more complex, I'm guessing there are challenges that come with that. Oh, absolutely. One of the biggest challenges is something called context length. It's like how much information the AI can hold in its memory. You know, as the models get more complex, longer context lengths, some of those post-training techniques, they become harder to do. So the more the AI can remember, the tougher it gets to train it for, like really complex tasks. Yeah, you could say that. And that leads to a big question. How do we handle all this? These ever-evolving AIs, what kind of hardware do we need? It's it's a big challenge. Yeah. And when you talk about hardware for AI, well, there's one name you can't ignore. Google's Tensor Processing Unit, or TPU. The TPU, yeah. It's kind of legendary, isn't it? In the AI chip world, I mean. So, so what's so special about it? Well, TPUs, they're built for this specific kind of math, matrix multiplications, which is like the heart of deep learning. So for certain AI tasks, they're super efficient. But what's really interesting is how Google uses them. And they have these super regions, right, where data centers are clustered together, like in Iowa and Nebraska. Huge clusters of TPUs all working together. So this is like the engine behind all of Google's AI, right? Yeah, you could say that. But here's the thing. They mainly use these TPUs for their own stuff. Google Search, you know, Gemini, their new AI, YouTube ads, all that. Wait, really? Why wouldn't they, I mean, wouldn't it make sense to use those TPUs for other AI models too? Mm -hmm. You know, get a bigger piece of the AI pie? You think so, right. But the TPU architecture, it's very specific to Google's needs. It's actually less efficient for running other AI models, kind of like a specialized tool, you know? Great for one job, not so much for others. So TPUs are like Google's secret weapon, but they're keeping it kind of in-house. Okay, that makes sense. But what about uh, the cloud? How does all this cloud computing fit into this mega cluster picture? The cloud's crucial because it gives companies access to all this computing power, even if they can't build their own mega clusters. And in the cloud world, the big dog is Amazon Web Services, or AWS. Then you have Microsoft Azure, and then Google Cloud. AWS, they're like the kings of the cloud, right? Why is that? 
A few reasons, really. Their interface is pretty user-friendly, they have good pricing, and they were early to the game. Plus, Amazon's always been good at serving both small and large customers, so they've grown like crazy. Makes sense. So if you want AI in the cloud, AWS is the place to go. Huh. But what about the actual hardware? Are we still in the age of NVIDIA when it comes to GPUs? NVIDIA is definitely the leader for now, <laughs> but there's competition coming. AMD, they have good hardware, but their software needs some work. Intel, well, they have a tougher road ahead. They've lost their edge in chip manufacturing, and the competition is fierce. So it's a battle for the top, but NVIDIA is holding on mm. for now. But there's also this trend of uh, hyperscalers designing their own chips, right? Exactly. Companies like Amazon they're making their own ARM-based server chips. And that's a direct challenge to Intel, who used to rule the server market. So things are changing fast. It's fascinating, really. This AI race, it's happening on so many levels. The size of the clusters, the hardware, everything's evolving. What does all this mean, do you think, for the future of AI? I think as AI models get more complex, and they will, access to these mega clusters, the cutting-edge hardware, it's going to be key. It could determine who leads the AI revolution. So it's like whoever has the biggest toys wins. In a way, yeah. It's like having the best lab, the fastest supercomputer. It gives you the power to solve the toughest AI problems, you know, make the big breakthroughs. But that raises a question, doesn't it? Will everyone have access to these resources or will it just be the, uh, the big tech companies? That's the question we need to answer. Can smaller players keep up or will AI become concentrated in the hands of a few? A big question with uh, big implications. The future of AI, its impact on society, it's all connected to these trends. Hmm. It's a lot to think about. It's its almost like we're, I don't know, at a turning point for AI, I mean. I think we are. And it's not just about, you know, the size of the clusters, but also how AI training is changing. Like we said, that line between pre-training and post-training, it's blurring. Right, right. It's less about feeding the AI a ton of data, more about teaching it to... Uh, to learn on its own in messy situations. Exactly. We want AI that's uh, adaptable, you know, that can handle anything you throw at it. It's like, uh, remember the old days of computing? Those giant mainframe computers? Oh, yeah, those things took up whole rooms. And now we have smartphones that are way more powerful and they fit in our pockets. That's a good point. Yeah. So AI is going through that same kind of uh, shrinking but getting more powerful at the same time. Exactly. It's becoming more uh, integrated into everything we do. Okay, so as we wrap up this deep dive, what are the, the key takeaways here? What should people remember about all this? Well, first, this race to build bigger AI clusters, it's heating up. The tech giants are all competing to be on top. It's like the space race, but for AI. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And second, AI training, it's moving towards those post-training tasks. The focus is on uh, making AI that can actually do stuff in the real world. Not just learn, but apply what it learns. Right. And third, Google, with their TPUs, they're doing their own thing. Your secret weapon. Yeah. They're using it to make their own products better. And lastly, the cloud, it's making AI accessible, even for companies that, you know, can't afford to build their own mega clusters. So it's kind of leveling the playing field a little bit. In a way, yeah. Yeah. It's letting more people get involved in the AI revolution. So, yeah, lots of trends, lots of change happening. It's exciting. But it also makes you wonder, you know, what's next? What's going to happen with all this? Any final thoughts? Yeah, I guess it's just uh, it's important to think about the bigger picture, right? Mm -hmm. Not just the technology itself, but how it's going to affect us, all of us. The ethical stuff, you know, the impact on society. It's a lot to consider. It is. And those are conversations we need to be having now as all this is developing. Exactly. Well, thanks for uh, for taking us on this deep dive. It's been really uh, eye-opening. Glad to be here. It's a fascinating topic. It is. And to everyone listening, until next time, yeah. stay curious.